Hey everybody and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Ashley Mova and this is the daily show where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California, talking about some Martian today. Also here is John Schnepp. I want those plans and I want them alive for the Martians. <laughs> Bring them to me. It's a different movie. I don't know. <laughs> I, didn't see, I, want them alive. I didn't see the Martian. Also, here's Mark Ellis. I can't wait to talk about the Martian. The part where Alf shows up and he's like, hey, <laughs> I just my planet just blew up. Bold Ridley Scott filmmaking yeah. right there. Yeah. Yes. Hey, folks, listen. As happens sometimes, something in the world of movie news dropped after we had finished writing the show notes. And in this case, it is the new trailer for the really Really interesting looking film, The Big Short. You've got guys like Steve Carell, uh, Christian Bale, Ryan Gosling. Who else was in that? Brad Pitt. Um, I mean, this this might be the most stacked, like A-list caliber acting talent wise film of the year. The first trailer finally dropped today. Brought to us by a very surprising director, Adam McKay. Mm -hmm. Schnepp, you just watched the trailer for it. What did you think about the new trailer for The Big Short? I loved it. I was like, who's not in it? It's like everybody just poured into this movie. And, uh, you know, it's a it's great because Adam McKay is a very, he's very politically minded. If you're pals with him on Facebook, you're like, you know, it's usually not comedy we're talking about on Facebook. It's serious issues. So it's really nice to see him tackling something like this, which is definitely quite serious. It's about how the banking uh, industry almost took us down, you know, and we're still dealing with it. We're still dealing with a lot of shady stuff going on in America. And this is, it's really cool to see someone tackling this. It's a very serious story and I'm very interested in seeing it. The trailer itself was really well put together. It had a little bit of a Goodfellas vibe to me. So I'm really excited about it. But there is going to be a lot of comedy in it. And and you can see that even yes. from the trailer, there are some laughs you get and you don't oh, expect yeah. it when you're talking about the housing market crashing. Yes. I rent an apartment. So even me, it's Still, it, it was such a big thing that happened, and everybody experiencing that when it went down, it's like, how did this happen? How did we let it get this far? Who discovered that this was going to be a thing? Did anybody know about this in advance and kind of get their stuff together and get out before it happened? And yeah, we are going to get all of that. And it says, based on a true story, this stuff actually happened. Like with any based on a true story film, we talked about this last week, I think. Somebody wrote in and was like, do you guys get upset when they change the facts about a true story to make it more entertaining? I hope they stick to the facts in here because the facts alone are worth making a movie about. Plus, this trailer continues the Mission Impossible 5 theme of having a Led Zeppelin tune in your trailer. <laughs> it's never a bad idea. Um, I... I have mixed feelings about the trailer, to be honest. First of all, I'm I'm really looking forward to the movie. I thought Steve Carell in the trailer looked amazing because whereas everybody else comes across as strong and cocky, Steve Carell, there's that one scene in the trailer where he's like on the stage talking like fraud. It, it always everything goes south when you do stuff like this, and the the camera goes. He goes, when did we forget that? And he looks honestly perplexed. Mm -hmm about that. He doesn't look like the strong mo that we are used to seeing in all the characters in these types of movies. I really like seeing that. Christian Bale looked really awesome as well. Totally different look for Brad Pitt than we've ever seen before. I think Ryan Gosling was Ryan Gosling in it. The one thing, though, that didn't work for me in the trailer, and I have a feeling the movie's not going to do this, but for whatever reason they did it in the trailer, it just kept hitting you over the head with like every five seconds there was a beat of, banks are corrupt. This is fraud, fraud, evil, naughty, naughty, bad on them. These are bad people. Like it was like they just kept, do, they hit you over the head with it. It felt like every five or 10 seconds, like it was like a cadence, beat them over the head with banks are bad, banks are bad, banks are bad. And banks may be bad. I'm just saying that you don't hit me over the head with it every five seconds. And it, it felt a little too on the nose for a trailer. There's no, there was no sense of subtlety to the trailer. And so that turned me off a bit from the trailer. I have a feeling, though, that the movie itself isn't going to feel that way. I just feel like they just put all of it in the trailer. I, I don't know. Did you... Do you guys think I'm off my rocker for that? I mean, the, the, the trailer moved quickly, and so my, my big issue with the trailer was that it was hard to tell wh who am I rooting for. Is anybody in here bad? Is anybody? Right. Am I going to walk yeah. into the theater and hate that person? I couldn't. It looked like everybody was kind of on the same team. Ryan Gosling, I'm a little concerned about what his character is, but my overwhelming take was that, well, this movie looks good. The haircuts are all atrocious, and <laughs> the, the, it comes out in Christmas, and it's a perfect counter-programming to something like Star Wars, where you go see Star Wars, and if you can't see Star Wars, you get something totally different which is I think it'll do well yeah I think uh, Christian Bale reminded me of Weird Al Yankovic <laughs> he looked like the white and nerdy Weird Al Yankovic version um, but uh, you know I, the the bank thing that them going back and back to that 
back and forth to that. It, the way the trailer, at least to me, felt like it felt like, oh, these guys are aware of this this insider banking thing, and they're going to shut it down. And as you went forward with the trailer, then you realize, I don't know if that's how what's going to happen or not. But then you see, oh, they're all in on maybe like trying to scoop money and mm -hmm. you know get in on it before it all cr everything crashes. So they're also doing bad things. So who's the who's the bad guy? Who's not the bad guy? So I don't think it's that black and white in this case. Gosling smelling a pretty big check. That, see, that <laughs> shot smelling alone, big check. Yes. that was one of the best shots in the trailer because it does exactly what you're suggesting. It shows multiple dimensions to these tra to these guys that, yeah, maybe they're uncovering something, but maybe some of them decide, uh, I don't know the true story right. of, of these guys. So maybe some they uncovered this terrible thing. They're trying to shut it down. But at the same time, hey, maybe I might as well make some money off it. Well, since I know about it, I mean, I, I don't know. And that's the good part about this trailer that makes me really look forward to the movie. Never take the time to smell the check, kids. Just get that bank <laughs> deposited it. as Cash fast that as you check. can. Get your app in front of it, take a picture of it, deposit <laughs> uh -huh. it, and walk we away. We all know what paper smells like. Just cash that check. <laughs> All right, what's our first official story today? With the highly anticipated Batman versus Superman now just six months away, many questions still linger about the future of a second standalone movie or if there will even be one. In a recent interview, director Zack Snyder added more confusion to the question when he said the following. I think in a way, Batman vs. Superman is Man of Steel 2. Justice League is kind of the transcendent Knights of the Round Table of the story. It'd be interesting to think about what a standalone Superman movie might be. John, does hearing Zack Snyder's comments make you more or less certain that there will be another standalone Superman movie? It actually makes me a little bit less certain. Look, I still look, if you ask me to put, like right now, do you think there's going to be a, a, a Man of Steel 2? Yes, I still believe there is. But I got to say, Snyder's comments do make me a little less certain of that when he comes out and says, well, you know, it kind of is Man of Steel 2. First of all, Zack Snyder, if you're just going to go back and forth on something, just stop saying things. I mean, he came out at first saying, okay, so Man of Steel 2 is going to be Batman versus Superman. And then he kind of retconned that saying, well, this isn't Man of Steel 2. This is Batman versus Superman. And now he's kind of, well, Batman versus Superman is kind of Man of Steel 2. It's like, you know what? <laughs> just stop. Stop. <laughs> Make the movie, stop talking about the movie. Um, but when he says things like that, well, this kind of is thing, uh, the, Knights of the Round Table, you know, it would be interesting to see Man of Steel 2. It's like, well, wait a minute, do they have plans for it? Do they not? I still totally believe they do. I still totally believe they're going to move forward with it. We don't have any dates for a standalone Batman film or a standalone Superman film, but I believe we're going to get them. But I got to admit, these comments from Zack Snyder's, at least to me, muddy the waters a little bit. Schnepp, you hear stuff like this, where does what does this do to you and where your thinking's at? It makes it, it makes me laugh a little bit. It makes me feel like Zack Snyder is very tired because <laughs> he's like, you know, the, you know, I'm really interested in seeing what a standalone Superman movie would be look like. And it's like you made one. It's called Man of Steel. What are you talking about? You actually made one already. How are you saying? I'm. I'm I wonder what a, an individual <laughs> Superman movie would look like. I just it boggles me. Hey, so I think what would happen? Tired. What would happen? If I put together a daily show that talked about movie news, <laughs> what would that look like? John, you're, bo you're blowing my mind. You mean every day as opposed to every other day or once a week? Mm -hmm. like no, like it was Monday daily. through Friday. Monday through Friday. And what? It would probably air sometime. We'd shoot it in the morning. You could be on it. I would be. I definitely, I would be on it. But I not just snap. What about, <laughs> no, throw right? Ellis in the mix. Ellis, we could get Ellis in there. This sounds incredible. That show would look very green. Yeah, have a kind of a greenish <laughs> set, sort of like this. Mm. It could be even this set if we we wanted to save money, just use this. Set. I mean, we've got it. Yeah, it's already here. This is our Knights of the Round Table. Let's talk about <laughs> this it. This is our Knights of the Round It's a little preemptive, guys. I don't know if we want to do a daily show. Let's just that hang seems on. Rather for a second. Ambitious. Yeah, it's rather yeah. ambitious. But I wonder what it would be like. If it happened. You know what movie I want to see what? is The Death of Man of Steel 2. What happened? <laughs> oh, no, I don't want to see that. I still think we're going to get this movie. And and it's It's like, why even call the movie Dawn of Justice when you really want to call it kind of Man of Steel 2-ish? I think we are going to see Superman. So you're going to see the, another standalone Superman movie with Henry Cavill as Superman. It just it, What this these comments mean to me is that they haven't established their priority yet as far as making more standalone movies. Obviously, you know you want to get Batman in there because Affleck is locked into that right. character too and he's a much bigger star than Henry Cavill is at this point. I think Batman, you know that a Batman movie is going to do well. It seems like they have a lot of confidence in what this Batman brings to the table, which is why they greenlit all those other Batman movies. 
movies. Justice League seems to be the priority here. That's what I get from these comments, is that yes, you are going to see another standalone Superman movie, but right now we need to get all the Knights of the Round Table on board. They haven't done what Marvel did where it's like, hey, here's our slate for the next 20 years. They, they might do that, and it might be a smart move to do that at some point. They haven't done it yet. You wonder when they unveiled to their board members what the next movies are going to be if they talked about this, if they right. talked about Man of Steel 2 and where that fits into their big plans. It just seems like they just don't know yet. Well, it's weird. Like I said, I think Snyder's tired. Once George Miller finally stops playing around and admits it, when they're doing Man of Steel 2, they'll be like, oh, that's when it's going to get released. I think, you know, it's going to happen. It has to happen. Before they do Cyborg, they're going to have Man of Steel 2. That's just a given, at least in my mind. So, do you think maybe Snyder's playing a little coy here? Like, do you think Snyder knows George Miller is on for Man of Steel 2, and he's just playing a little coy with the audience? I, ha I have to think? think that way, because him saying, like, I wonder what a Superman movie would be like. It's just it boggling to me. So either it's taken out of context, like that little snippet is from a larger discussion where they're talking about what he would have done with Man of Steel 2, or it just seems so weird to me. Just rest like, assured that uh, as, uh, as much as we fans really can't wait for March to roll around, it it's, takes so long if you're Zack Snyder for this movie to come out. Because right. you're going to keep getting this question yeah. until this movie actually comes out then they announce what they're going to do going forward with Batman and with Superman and what the timetable is. You know, that the movie is still six months away. That's, let's just let that depress you for let's a minute. just get to the martian okay well let's just get october 2nd is the next <laughs> cool movie that we oh. all want to see well before we get to the martian we got something else to talk about so okay. ashley what's next as many of you will remember we recently discussed that actress emily blunt had signed on to star in the upcoming feature film adaptation of girl on the train it was also announced that mission impossible rogue nation star rebecca ferguson was also joining the cast now it looks like we may have our leading men as the hollywood reporter says that both chris evans and jared leto are both in negotiation to join the film as well. Girl on the Train is described like this. Rachel takes the same commuter train every morning. Every day, she rattles down the track, flashes past a stretch of cozy suburban homes, and stops at the signal that allows her to daily watch the same couple breakfasting on their deck. She's even started to feel like she knows them. Jess and Jason, she calls them. Their life as she sees it is perfect, not unlike the life she recently lost. And then she sees something shocking. It's only a minute until the train moves on, but it's enough. Now everything's changed. Unable to keep it to herself, Rachel offers what she knows to the police and becomes inextricably intertwined in what happens next as well as in the lives of everyone involved. Has she done more harm than good? Mark, would Evans and Leto be a good addition to Girl on the Train? Oh boy, that was a long description, yeah. and I loved every word of it. This sounds exciting. I love that it's going to be Emily Blunt and Rebecca Ferguson. The winner gets to play Captain Marvel. That's gonna. <laughs> that's the way you pitch this movie. And uh, as far as Leto and Evans go, yeah, I mean, this is this this cast is really rounding itself out nicely. The addition of both of those guys and doing a different role than we're going to have seen them recently with Leto as the Joker and with Chris Evans as Captain America and all those movies. Yeah, I. Totally. I'm excited about this movie now. I'm, I've am i been excited about this movie since I first read it. When they announced Emily Blunt was going on, and then they announced Rebecca Ferguson was joining her, and Emily Blunt is going to be the lead in this film, apparently. And now you add names like this. Now, we were just talking about The Big Short, which is easily going to be the most stacked movie filled with A-list talent. But this is a pretty impressive-looking cast that's shaping up now. Should mention... The Hollywood Reporter also mentioned that while these two guys are in talks and negotiations, the Hollywood Reporter mentioned that there could be some scheduling conflicts that are holding things up for one or for one or both of them, perhaps, and they're trying to get those worked out right now. So we won't fall over shock if one of these guys doesn't end up being in the movie. But if you do end up getting a movie that sounds as great as this, this is a great sounding premise for a film to me, with Emily Bunt, Re Rebecca Ferguson, Jared Leto, Chris Evans. That's just so full of goodness. I'm excited about it. I cannot wait to see this, so I'm really enthused. Yeah, me too. I love the premise. It definitely the, harkens back to like the old film noir thrillers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like, you know, with the, 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 the two Captain Marvels being in it, you know, that's <laughs> exciting enough. Now you got Captain America and the Joker. It's going to be, I don't know, it's a it's a freak fest for superheroes that has nothing <laughs> to do with superheroes. So that's, I'm glad that, you know, it's like, it's cool to see these uh, these actors who are like now in the, the superhero game you know, break out and have fun in w regular movies. And I'm looking forward to this film. So, all right, what's next? 
In two weeks, the new Matt Damon film, The Martian, will hit theaters. Last night, Fox Studios hosted a screening for the press, which John and Mark attended. So, Mark, what did you think of The Martian? I mean, I thought it might be the best movie I've seen all year. It's so <laughs> good. I absolutely love everything about this movie. I'm a huge fan of Castaway, and this movie felt like Castaway meets Apollo 13, and I might have liked this movie better than both of those films. It's just so good. The fact that you get to see Matt Damon on Mars and you get to cut back to Earth and shots of, are we going to be able to help this guy out at all? It was so thrilling. It was so suspenseful. I felt like it was based on a true story. Like, I felt like I was watching it did feel that way, didn't historical it? <laughs> events. Everything felt so real to me. And it's not just Matt Damon's show. Where is Castaway? It's pretty much Tom Hanks in a volleyball with a cameo by Helen Hunt. This one, you have Matt Damon, but you also have amazing performances by guys like Jeff Daniels, She Will Tell Edu for, uh, Kristen Wiig, Jessica Chastain, Michael Payne. It was so good. The, from start to finish, I was so wrapped up in this movie. I, I can't stop thinking about it. It is the movie you need to rush out to see next. I promise you. I uh, I loved it. <laughs> I loved this movie. I And all I could think about walking out of the theater was finally Ridley mm-hmm. Scott is back. Finally, now I, I I I should probably stop myself there. I'm not going to say he's back yet. Give me one more good one, but I'm definitely going to say this is a triumph for Ridley Scott because on top of everything that Mark just said, which I echo completely, one of the things that really stands out as a triumph in this film is the direction. Mm -hmm. There's a great story here based on a fantastic book. Drew Goddard did a very good job adapting the book as well. But when it comes down to it, when you really think about a lot of the scenes in this movie, a lot of them could have fallen flat. And it's the direction of these scenes that really made them stand out to me. There, there is so much tension and and humor and senses of awe and wonder. And there's just this wonderful sense. There's a scene that you see in one of the trailers where Jeff Daniels goes, This is, you know, this is bigger than one man. And then you see Sean Bean going, No, it's not. And that there's that theme that's very, very subtle. I, I actually kind of wish they weren't as subtle in the movie with it, but that very subtle theme about one man, one human life for the rest of us is worth it to, to try to do something. I was, f- the performances you mentioned, Jeff Daniels was amazing in this movie. He fits so well into his character. I think it's going to go over some people's heads. I think a lot of people are, are going to walk out and they're not even going to think about how good Jeff Daniels was until you really sit down and think about it. Like he was stunning. Chiwetel Ejiofor was just to Chiwetel Ejiofor. I think he's one of the top four best actors on the planet today. Um, Dennis, I keep forgetting the name of the engineer dude that you said was in Sunshine. Oh, Benedict Wong. Yeah. Benedict Wong, who plays like the, like the main engineer in this thing. He, him and Jeff Daniels just melt into their character so perfectly, it almost felt like the scenes he was in was documentary footage. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just what it, it felt like to me. And Matt Damon, man, he kept you riveted. So much of this movie, obviously, is him alone. And the way he was able to keep you riveted and the devices that come from the book and what um, uh, Ridley Scott introduced keep dialogue going in a realistic way that keeps you totally enthralled. It was visually beautiful. The there's it's not an action film, but man, you felt action tension so many times oh, like, I was throughout the so film, right? locked into it and I felt like I was on Mars during those scenes I, and yeah. it wasn't just the acid I dropped no I didn't take anything <laughs> I, I, I was totally sober watching this movie and I felt like I was on another planet watching Matt Damon and I was with this guy and I wanted to get back to Earth so bad and the scenes in outer space and the scenes on Earth I just wherever I was if it was a boardroom or if it was on Mars I felt like I was right there and it's so rare for a movie to be able to do that from start to finish the movie's two hours and 20 minutes I think something like that it didn't and feel it like it flies by flew by to, to the point that when i walked out look at the clock i'm like you're kidding me. like i know the movie started you, you cannot be this late but so some great lines as well like, i love and this part really i love this part the survivor kind of movie as it is you know kind of like you were mentioning the tom mm-hmm. hanks film <laughs> you know this science bitch and like stuff like that it was just 
It and it's so unexpectedly funny. Like the book is very funny, but there are things you can do in a novel that you can't do on the big screen. But they found ways. There's one scene in particular. I was just telling Schnepp about it. I won't say it here because it'd be a spoiler. Involving Sean Bean and maybe a former project that he used to be involved in. That I thought I was going to choke. I was laughing so hard on it. Like there's some great humor. Look, I came out of Black Mass. And I really like Black Mass a lot. I, and I said at the time, I'll be surprised. I, I didn't think it was win Best Picture, but I said, I'll be really surprised if it's not nominated for Best Picture at one point. But I remember saying to you the night, the day before you saw it, and I said to you, um, I really enjoy blah, blah, blah. I, it, it's not a movie that's for everyone, mm -hmm. but, I, but I really enjoyed it. I won't understand people who don't like this movie. I mean, all film subjective totally, but I won't be able to wrap my head. What is there not to love about this film? Man, if, if it's not my favorite film of the year so far, it challenges Inside Out for me as my favorite film of the year. I, it, it's astounding. Well done, Ridley Scott. I'm totally pumped. Yeah, I'm going to throw Damon in there as a front runner for Best Actor nomination. I'm going to throw the movie definitely is going to get nominated for Best Picture. And I'll say this. I mean, we all railed against the trailer when it came out because we thought it gave away way too much. And then some people who read the book were like, well, that doesn't really give away everything. I still think the trailer gave away a little bit too much, but it's not going to ruin your experience of the movie at all. This is a movie you rush out to the movie theater to go see. That reminds me. One of my favorite things about this movie, you mentioned the first trailer. If you saw those first trailers, there's so all that, you know, the the mission, the, the Mars mission team, like in their preps, they're on the ship, they're traveling, they're talking, introducing everybody. I expected this movie to start and we get 10 minutes of Matt Damon finding out he got to be in the mission and then 10 minutes of the, the crew going to Mars and 15 minutes of them being there and then something bad happens. Screw that. This is a tiny, tiny spoiler. The Martian. Go! And the movie just starts. Within like 30 seconds, they're gone and Matt Damon's left on Mars. It's the, the I love it when movies don't piss around. They just dive right. right into it and go. And it's funny because this isn't a fast movie. I was telling this to Dennis and Wendy as we were talking about after the film. This isn't a fast movie. This isn't like a frantically paced movie. But there are no wasted frames in this movie. This is a great example of a movie that's not a fast movie, but that had great pace. Not a single shot, not a single frame of this movie was wasted. Every single frame had a purpose. It kept the story moving forward. It kept you enthralled. And I'll be honest with you. Even in movies I love, I don't often get this sense of disappointment when the movie's over. But when this movie's, the credits started to roll, I was disappointed. I wanted more. Right. And bring your colostomy back. Because, look, I saw people that were walking out to go pee at some point. And, look, I like to pee during a movie if I have to. I don't want to hold it but hold it during this movie. Because I saw people walk out and then something happens in the next minute before they come back. And I'm like, oh, boy, did you miss something big. So make sure you're locked in the entire movie. You're not going to regret it. Schnepp, go see this movie as soon as you can. I am super excited to see this movie. I'm bummed I didn't see it yesterday, but I cannot wait now, especially with you guys' review, because I was one of the people who felt like, oh, those trailers showed too much. Dennis saw the movie yesterday. I, said, mm -hmm. I asked him, I was like, did the, did the trailers show too much? He said, no. You know, you, they show a little bit like you get the idea he's stranded on Mars, yeah. which is fine. That's great. But at least there's a lot more to it. You know? Yeah, and a lot of the characters are not what you expect. I, and you mentioned Matt Damon's going to be a lock for a Best Actor nomination. I, I, got, I really hope Jeff Daniels gets in there for a Best Supporting right. Actor. I really, really do. All right, folks, it's that time of the show now for Buy or Sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to list them off. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? According to a report in Variety, Lionsgate is already planning a sequel to the new film Sicario, which opened in just six theaters this past weekend and goes wide later this week. The film made over $400,000 while playing on just six screens, giving it a per screen average of over $66,000, the highest mark for any film this year. Schnepp buyers sell Lionsgate already putting the wheels in motion for Sicario 2. Sounds exciting. I mean, we were just talking about that yesterday. It sounds like everyone wants to see this film. We we in L.A. were lucky enough. We could, if we wanted to right now, go see this film because it's just opened up here in the, you know one or two screens as playing in New York. So limited theater, theatrical release. Now they're going to go wide. It's like I think the wider, the better. Who, what company released this? Lionsgate. Yeah, if they want to get that money, they better get that wide release because everyone talking about it right now is saying it's a really fun, exciting thriller. So I'm, When we were talking about on the box office 
report yesterday. One of the things we mentioned is like, hey, usually the number one movie gets between five, six, or seven thousand dollars per screen, and Everest, which was on five hundred screens, had a thirteen thousand dollar per screen average, and like that's amazing. Sicario had sixty six thousand. Now, granted, <laughs> it was only in six theaters. I mean, if anybody wanted to see them, they had to go to those theaters. But still, that bodes well for them. I still think it's a little presumptuous. I think you want to wait till this thing goes wide, see what the fans' reaction to the film is. Mm -hmm. But hey, there's no no harm in at least starting the planning stages. You can always pull the plug on plans. That's fine. But I still do feel like it's a little presumptuous. So just for now, I'm going to sell. Mark, you're the only person at this table who's seen Sicario right Thank now. Thank you. What's your <laughs> thought on all this? Uh, I think it's a little early to greenlight a sequel because I saw the movie. I enjoyed it. It's no Martian. I, I would probably... Uh, I'd still give it fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, um, but uh, it didn't like wrap me up, and I didn't leave the theater saying I need to see another one of these. Having said that, it's a very well done movie. It's very well made. The performances are terrific, and it does have room to where you could have more stories in this universe. So I understand a studio being like, hey, we think we might have a hit on our hands. Let's go ahead and start the wheels in motion to make a sequel, but don't start clearing out schedules just yet. See how the movie does and see what the fans' reaction to it is. So I think it's a, it's a solid action film. It's nothing that was tremendous that I'm like, oh no, we need to go back to this again and again and again. It might happen. Well, you're wearing your Emily Blunt t-shirt, you know? I'm a big <laughs> Emily Blunt fan. Yeah, <laughs> Who is, is not a big Emily Blunt fan? That's right. All right, what's next? It has been announced that Jordan Peele, one half of the Key and Peele comedy team, will direct <laughs> the upcoming horror film Get Out for Boomhouse Productions. Peele, who also wrote the script for the film, said the following. People know me for my work in comedy, but now I'll get to focus on my passion for writing and directing horror films. Like comedy, horror has an ability to provoke thought and further the conversation on real social issues in a very powerful way. Get Out takes on the task of exploring race in America, something that hasn't really been done within the genre since Night of the Living Dead 47 years ago. It's long overdue. John Barisal, Jordan Peele directing Get Out. I am a big fan of Jordan Peele. I love the stuff that he, he and Key have done. I'm going to sell this for now and only because of my own personal experience, which is I have zero personal experience with Jordan Peele in horror films. So apparently he's, he may have a, a bit of a background. He said he's got a long-term passion for it. I'm totally for a guy who's kind of seen in one light, like he is in comedy, to then expand themselves and do other things. I think that's great. But just for me, myself as a fan right now, until I see something, I'm going to say sell for now, but I will admit, totally intrigued to see what he does, and I'm glad he's doing it. So anyway, that's how I see Mark, what about you? Uh, I buy this is simply because of who he's working with to make the movie. It's like you can Blumhouse, make movies, yeah. and, and it can be on a, on a dime budget. It's not a it's not a high-wire act where you need $100 million to make this movie. And yeah, like you said, Key and Peele are just so... The, the show is just amazing. The sketches just do not miss. Every one of them is hysterical. So I think there will be comedic elements in this horror movie, which it totally lends itself to. But I'm interested to see what else he has in that very talented comedic brain of his that could be more of a horror slant. So yeah, I'm totally excited for this. Schnepp? Yeah, I'm going to buy it 100%. You know, having directed a comedy show for years and then jumped right into doing a horror movie, then doing a documentary. I think you can change and switch up quite easily, especially if you have a passion for it. Peel's incredibly talented. Uh, the title of it um, made me think it was a comedy because it, it reminded me of Amityville. Get out! <laughs> and then he's involved, so is it like, is it a haunted house? Kind of like, is there a comedic bent to it? But was it an it, Eddie Murphy skit? Was it Eddie Murphy goes, I don't understand people, white people in these horror movies, man, because if I'm in the house and I hear, get out, we're gone. We're I know, gone. yes, it was, yeah. yeah. I just remember that Eddie Murphy line was, yeah. get out. That's yeah. what I thought of when I heard the title. Yeah, this definitely reminded me of that, but you know what he's actually referring to is, yeah, the original Night of the Living Dead, which had a black lead actor at the time in the 60s where that was unheard of. So I think what he's going to do is uh, so going to be something unique and special, especially going for that kind of bent, that angle on a horror film. So I'm, I'm really looking forward and, to it. Yeah, comedy and horror, too, they're 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 so reliant on yes. timing, and so if you yeah. can get comedic timing down, you probably have a good chance to nail a horror tone as well. Yep. All right, folks. Well, listen, it's Tuesday, which means it's time for us to start talking about the new movies coming out in what's opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Now, we've got a couple of films we're going to talk about on Thursday, which is uh, Hotel Transylvania 2 and Green Inferno. 
But the first one we're going to talk about today is the new Robert De Niro uh, and Hathaway film, The Intern. So Ashley, tell us about it. Starting a new job can be a difficult challenge, especially if you're already retired. Looking to get back into the game, 70-year-old widower Ben Whitaker, played by Robert De Niro, seizes the opportunity to become a senior intern at an online fashion site. Ben quickly becomes popular with his younger co-workers, including Jules Austin, played by Anne Hathaway, the boss and founder of the company. Whitaker's charm, wisdom, and sense of humor help him develop a special bond and growing friendship with Jules. Schnepp, are you looking forward to The Intern? I am. I'm, I'm really looking forward to The Intern. I think uh, Robert De Niro and uh, Anne Hathaway, just from the trailers, it seems like, uh, what was that one, like Google Interns or whatever? The, yeah, the, the internship. It's just called The Internship or something. <laughs> That's a movie I didn't want to see with the word intern in it. And this is a movie I do want to see with the word intern in it. And it's because of Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway and, and their chemistry and the way that it would seem like, it, you know, you, you see that a lot in uh, fast food restaurants where they have senior hour, like in the mornings or, you know, the whole bunch of seniors are working at a restaurant because they're like, hey, we, you know, it's high school students or seniors. That's what we can rock. It's like, now as we move on and like there's seniors who want to stay active and I think this is going to broach that subject where seniors are not you know invalid because they're older seniors are very val valid because they are older because of their experiences their life experiences and what they could bring to the table on any job that they're going to try to you know you know put some wisdom down so that's what I think this movie is going to be about and it feels like that from seeing the trailers and then you have Robert De Niro like he's hit and miss sometimes like seems like he's just been collecting checks on a lot of movies recently but this movie definitely is using that you know that De Niroism that the stuff that we like about Robert De Niro and I feel like that's going to come through in the film so you know I, I buy it 100%. I'm actually really surprised how much I'm looking forward to this movie it's like I buy this completely and, and I'm really looking forward to the film very very much I'm kind of sad that I haven't seen it already but every trailer for me has hit it I mean it just really has it's been charming and funny and not only does you know our leads look really good and I think they're gonna have great on-screen yeah. chemistry together the supporting cast has looked really good in these trailers that scene where Rene Russo plays like the office masseuse mm -hmm. and they, they got a, they put a towel over <laughs> it. that's it's a great scene and I just think there's a lot of charm and you're right I one of the things that I'm looking forward to is what you were mentioning. I think they're gonna talk about ageism. Look, ageism is actually an issue we do not talk about nearly enough. It's like, you're right. We have this mentality that you know once somebody gets over you know 58 or something, they just lose their value. And it's like, no, absolutely not. And I, I'm hoping that this movie's gonna explore that a little bit. So I'm super stoked to see it. Mark, what about you? Uh, is Emily Blunt in this movie? <laughs> Sell. <laughs> no, I, I do wanna see uh, The Intern uh, very much. So I'm looking forward to talking about this for at least an hour on the phone with my mom after she sees it. Because this is definitely a mom opening weekend movie. Nancy Myers is the right person to handle material like this. Because Shep, you, you, you nailed it. It's like you could have Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson and boy, are they gonna have some shenanigans. They're too to be interns this looks like it's earnest it's down to earth it does take a premise that could be seen as wacky but it feels real it doesn't feel like they're forcing this zany comedic premise on you it feels like i i get it this guy i think he lost his wife and he's just he's looking for something to do he he doesn't want to just be retired he wants to keep contributing and so when he gets into this modern workplace there's going to be some odd situations but it's not just for comedic value it's also to get you right here a little bit and i like movies like that you're mentioning that de niro can be a little bit hit and miss and you know sometimes in comedies when De Niro tries to be a comedic actor like he did in um oh what's the one he did with B Billy Crystal and analyze the, this yeah and analyze, analyze that. that right when he like analyze that which was a terrible sequel just so when you see Robert De Niro trying to do comedy right now it kind of fails but where I find he really works is when he just as an actor just goes into the role and just lets the character kind of take over. We saw him do that in Las Vegas. I'm one of the few guys who I'm a big endorser of Las Vegas. I really enjoyed that film. And this feels the same way. It just feels like he's not trying to do comedy. It feels like he's just inhabiting this character who is in this situation and let the comedy come out. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that's the way it plays out because it's been effective for me so far. 
All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. So, Ashley, what is in the mailbag today? Tanner Brown writes, hey, guys, love the show. I was just wondering, now that the early reviews are in for Fantastic Four and they are overwhelmingly negative, do you think that Deadpool, although being rated R, will make more money than Fantastic Four? My money's on yes, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks, and keep up the great work. Yeah, here's the funny thing. If you had asked me two months ago, do I think Deadpool, being an R, a bit of a gamble, a bit of a roll of the dice, is an R-rated thing. Not, I mean, hugely popular character Deadpool is amongst comic book fans, but against people who aren't comic book fans, not really that well known. I would have said two months ago, no way. Now, I was also under the assumption two months ago that even though it wasn't going to be a huge blockbuster hit, I thought Fantastic Four worldwide, when all said was done, would probably be around the $400 million mark. I think that would have been a safe assumption. Fantastic Four has made $163 million. Yeah. The answer worldwide? might Yeah, worldwide. It's uh, made $55 million domestically, which it should have shattered on opening weekend alone. Um, so $163 million worldwide, and that's, it's not going to make much more than that. Um, the answer to your question is yes. Deadpool will make more money this. Now, will it get into that... $400 million, $500 million range. I'm a little bit more apprehensive of that. I don't think that should be our definition for success for Deadpool. If Deadpool gets in the $250, $275 million range, I think you call that an unequivocal success, especially since they're going to keep the budget on this film reasonable. It's the first film. It's a very different kind of film, and it's an R-rated film. I think if it hits like 275 we should all be saying Deadpool is absolutely a success. Um, so if it doesn't hit those $300 million marks, don't start coming out with, what went wrong with Deadpool? Nothing. It's a different measuring. But two months ago, I was said, no way Deadpool makes as much Fantastic Four. Eh, eh, not so much anymore. Now I absolutely anticipate it's going to make more than Fantastic Four. Mark, what do you think? I think Deadpool is going to top Fantastic Four's entire domestic run in its opening weekend. I think Deadpool is going to crush opening weekend. It might be a record type film for an R-rated opening. I don't know what currently is the highest R-rated movie of all time. I think it's The Hangover still. Is that right? Or maybe The Hangover 2. But I think Deadpool is going to be a phenomenal success. And not just because I think the movie is going to be good. I think that the buzz around it, the fact that they they had the rocks to make an R-rated movie. Don't forget what we talked about yesterday, too, is that Colossus does have somewhat of an appearance in this movie. So we know that it is an X-Men. An X-Men in an R-rated film, that's intriguing. And the fact that it's opening, what, in February? When you're not going to have a lot of competition. It's, I think it's going to slaughter Fifty Shades of whatever. It's, <laughs> is there even a Fifty Shades movie coming out? This There isn't. Deadpool is going to be the the most money making movie in February. Okay, so here's here just to get interesting question you brought up highest opening weekends for R rated films. the The fifth biggest one was Passion of the Christ at eighty three million. The fourth was Fifty Shades of Grey at eighty five million. Uh, the number three all time was The Hangover Part Two at eighty five million. Number two is American Sniper at eighty nine million. The all time opening weekend box office record for an R rated film is The Matrix Reloaded at ninety two million. Right. That's a tall order. Ninety two <laughs> might be tall for for Deadpool, but right. I think it's definitely I think it's definitely topping sixty. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm going to say it's going to kick a hundred. That's a, just from the buzz. I think everyone is excited about this film. And Deadpool's not like the most well known Marvel character, but neither was Iron Man. And this has more buzz on it than Iron Man had before it came out. Uh, so I think the R rating is almost a plus side for this. So let's see it get pushed. Let's see. And hopefully the reviews, that's the one thing that would kill it from making $100 million is if the reviews for the film, like the couple weeks before. Well, look what happened to Fantastic Four. Yeah, right. that's if, it, if it's like Deadpool's like, a, you know, 23 Rotten Tomatoes or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like it'll probably crush it and crush it down to like $40 million. It'll probably still make more than Fantastic Four, though. You're right. But uh, if the reviews and, and everything that we've seen from it so far – Everything looks really exciting and different about it. And that's what is fun about these superhero films is that they can, all of these can fit into different categories. And this fi film definitely feels breaking the fourth wall, really pushing the limit, being an R-rated film. It's breaking that new ground, sort of in that kick-ass terrain. Mm. So I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll definitely put, I think it'll be a big hit if it doesn't suck. So. See, one of the big di differences between Fantastic Four and Deadpool in terms of how the marketing has gone, while I think for the most part we really enjoyed the trailers for Fantastic mm -hmm. Four, what we never got from the trailers for Fantastic Four, and there's nothing wrong with this, but we never got a sense of what's their approach with Fantastic Four. I just knew they put together some really good looking trailers, but we didn't get a sense of what's their philosophy with Fantastic Four, what direction they're going with Fantastic Four. They just made some good looking trailers. 
with Deadpool going to what you're saying about the only thing that might stop it from cracking that 50, 60 million dollar mark is if the early reviews are really bad. I get a feeling from the Deadpool trailer that we got and from everything we've seen, we have gotten a good look at what their whole philosophy with this character is mm -hmm. and what their approach to this movie is. And it's all been spectacular. I'm anticipating good word of mouth when this thing comes out. The one thing I'll say is different too, like you mentioned that you know a lot of people, there wasn't a lot of buzz about Iron Man before it came out. I would suggest that that was true until the Comic-Con trailer dropped. Then once the Comic-Con trailer, trailer dropped, then there was a tangible buzz. Mm -hmm. I think I think they're saving the best of Deadpool's marketing. I, think, I don't think we've seen it yet. I don't think that that trailer we saw, which is as good as it was, I don't think that's the best one yet. I think we are. Gonna, I think they're holding something back right. for later. And again, it comes out in February, and it's not going to have the competition that even Fantastic Four did. I mean, Fantastic right. Four had to deal with Mission Impossible Five still being on fire. It had straight out of Compton the weekend after it. So I don't think Deadpool is going to have that level of competition. Ant Man was already out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what's weird about the Fantastic Four trailer though is so many sequences that were in the trailer weren't in, the, in movie, the movie, as well as like just even the tone, and they were like, "What's coming? Change is coming." That line's not even in the not movie. Not even. That's not, there's so much that's not in the movie. The that, two you know, premiere like, shots and scenes from the trailers. The, you don't know what's coming. What is coming? Doom. Not in the movie. The other premiere shot, the thing being Dropping. bombed out of the thing, <laughs> not in the movie. Like the yeah. main marquee moments of their trailers. And not I, I love the, the eh, the effects weren't out. We didn't have time to finish it. Well, why'd you put them in the trailer? <laughs> <laughs> when the door closes. <laughs> Look over there. Yeah. You know okay. <laughs> All right, what's next? Last question of the day. Griffin Dumier writes, Dear Collider crew, I'm a huge fan of the show and have been for a long time. My question is simply, why are you not doing a Game of Thrones Scream it, show? Ashley! <laughs> I love the show. A lot of people love the show. I'm sorry, but some of the shows that you are recapping, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., aren't that beloved. Thanks, and keep on keeping on. I love it's when Ashley cap. starts doing attitude voice. <laughs> I love Ashley attitude voice. Um, Can I just say it like the nerd? Why are you not exploring the Game of Thrones recap now? Why? <laughs> there we go. In defense of uh, of Griffin, you're not the only person asking me this day. And thanks a lot for sending the question. I'm going to have a little bit of fun with you, though, right? <laughs> it's just all in fun, all in fun. But ever since we announced, for those of you who don't know, and most of you do by now, we are starting some recap shows for six shows. We're really excited about it. We already had our first preseason special for uh, Empire, and that went really great. I'm excited about it. We're also doing uh, Arrow, Flash, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Supergirl, and The Blacklist. Um, but ever since we announced those things out, obviously, look, no matter what six shows we announce, and I knew this in advance. I mean, Dennis and I had conversations about this. We knew this in advance. No matter what six shows we, we announced, and this is cool, we knew we were going to get thousands of emails of, why not this show? Or why not that show? That's understandable, no problem. But one of the things I was surprised at, because when we announced the first six shows, we very clearly said what our parameters were. One, that we think it's going to have an audience. Two, it has to be starting in September or October, so starting out. And three, no Netflix shows. Now, let me get to the Netflix shows before we get to Game of Thrones. With the Netflix shows, uh, there are a couple of Netflix shows that I really, really love, but doing a, net, doing a recap show for a Netflix show, I just believe was not practical. When we discuss it, it's just not practical because of the way Netflix releases them. When Netflix puts out a new show, they put out all the episodes at once, and that's great. But the thing is, how do you do a weekly recap show based on a show that already had all of its things put out, all of its episodes put out? So by the time we get to episode 11, well, then heavens, most of the audience already saw that show three months ago, and they're not coming back to watch recaps episode after episode. It just wasn't practical. Even though there were some magnificent shows, you know, whether it's Game of Game of Cards or House of Cards, I was going to say Game of Cards and House of Thrones, <laughs> uh, House of Cards. <laughs> Or whether it's Daredevil or things like some great ones. It's not that's not us making commentary on how great the shows on Netflix are. It's just a matter of that it didn't feel practical for us to do a weekly recap show. So now, even though I laid all that out, no Netflix shows, has to be starting in September, October, whatever. I I'm not exaggerating when I when I tell you this, the amount of emails I got exceed 300. Exceed 300 emails I got specifically for people asking me. Why on earth are you not doing Game of Thrones? The answer is because as of right now, there is no Game of Thrones. There is no Game of Thrones. 
until I think what is it, April or May? Yeah, it'll be back. Yeah. It, it's going to be back in April or May. Talk to us again in seven or eight yeah. months. We couldn't launch with the Game of Thrones after show when there was. I had a lot of people asking me, "Why are you doing Mr. Robot?" Shows that start in September. Mr. Robot was in its like like End. season finale yeah. by the time we were starting our shows. Like, uh, no, we set our parameters out. So, um, yeah, that is why we do not have uh, uh, Game of Thrones. That is why we don't have Daredevil or House of Cards, whatever. It's because the shows had to fall in those parameters. Now, that still means there's room for people to to complain, legitimate complaints about, you know, maybe they have shows that they love that they want to see that we're not doing. But those are the six we pick to start with. Remember, we have a goal with our recap shows, which is we don't want to just do six. We want to do 26. We want to do 30. But we're starting with six to see if you guys want it and to see if we're any good at it. Um, and then once we get past that, then we'll probably start expanding what we're doing. And, you know, a lot of people also ask me, like, John, you love, why is there no Supernatural? You love Supernatural. John, you love Grimm. Why is there no Grimm? Because we, we're not putting these shows together based on what I love. This is about our audience and what you guys love. And even though... You know, Supernatural is my favorite show on TV right now. This isn't about me. And I don't think a lot a lot of people watch Supernatural, so we're not going to do a Supernatural show. So we did the best that we could putting these shows together, and we knew that no matter what six shows we did, we knew some like a lot of people weren't going to be happy. They wish we did others. But please keep in mind, this is just our start, and uh, we're going to see how we do with this thing. And you guys have anything you want to add to that? So wait, so, so Schnapp, so Game of Thrones comes back in April, yeah. and it's September now, yeah. so why can't we do an after show? I don't get it. Well, look, do an after if show. we get in the time machine that I've got parked outside, we could see all 10 episodes, then get back here and ruin it for everyone, and then get killed. Wait, I, love, will be I, love you, I love how you parked the... your time machine now. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> like you, I leave it there all like the time, just, yeah, yeah, I just drove my time machine. Like I could have taken my normal car, but I decided to take the time machine. Ellis, I like the way ice cream tastes in 1952 don't get angry at me because i wasted on going back in time to just have ice cream Actually, i'm curious ashley aside from pretty little liars mm -hmm. um what show would if you could pick one right now that we that we're not covering right which one would you pick for us to cover oh my gosh that's a toughie okay i love american horror story but here's the issue with that's american a good horror one story we came close to american horror story it's it's because every season kind of has like a different theme. Mm -hmm. It's like an anthology it, like series. Like the last season, I was not into it at all. You didn't like the first I, I wasn't into the circus. It, the first season, the second season, I was I loved it, but the coven. last season did not. The coven was the best it one, was I the thought. Best. It I was the best. I thought the coven was the best, but the, the circus show for me was second best. But where, really? Where, where are we in this season? We're it like hasn't at a even, Marriott it has, or something. It hasn't right? started. It's supposed it's, to be at a hotel. Yeah, a hotel. Ray sweet. was saying that's supposed to be it's about the hotel Cecil thing. But I'm not sure. Do you guys remember about Hotel Cecil? No. No. Oh my gosh. Is that I'm the one where the girl? Yes. Were, that video always freaks yes. me out. Wait, freaks wait, me out. Really? And I, I love horror stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Where is what? 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 What Ooh. city is it in? Hollywood. We're like you know minutes away from yeah. this. Oh, hotel. really? Because you know Oklahoma City is, which I've been in hotels there. It's like the most haunted. Like <gasps> there's a there's. Have a, you had any experiences? Uh, I've had a couple weird things. Like in what? Hotels. I stay in oh hotels God. all the time. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. Are you a ghost? Dun, dun. I kind of felt like you were. Get out. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Zing. <laughs> All right, uh. folks. That'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, listen, don't forget, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, keeping up to date on all the shows we're doing, but not Game of Thrones, uh, <laughs> but everything else we would keep up to date. And listen, lots of great films right now are playing out our friends over at AMC Theaters. Uh, Dennis is going to be mad at me because I did that out of order. Head on over to <laughs> www.amctheaters.com for all of your showtime and movie ticket information. I want to thank the dude sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here, getting ready to hop back in his time machine for some 1950s ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You can find me just at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. Uh, you can also find me in Salt Lake City, Utah this weekend at the Salt Lake City Comic Con. I know Chris Evans is going to be there, but I'm going to be there too. And I'm going to show my movie, The Death of Superman Lives, what happened. We're going to have Blu-rays and DVDs. We're going to party and be really weird comic book <laughs> nerds. So I'll see you there. And also here in L.A., if you live in L.A., you can see my film at the Lemley's Music Hall. It's going to be playing there September 25th to October 1st. There's daily shows. It's actually being, it's in a theater. Get some popcorn and sweat it out with Tim Burton and Kevin Smith. Check my movie out. You can check it out there. I'll be there doing a Q&A on Monday and Tuesday of next weekend, of next week, but take care. And over here on my right, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? Ooh, I will be at, uh, <laughs> I'm at the Atlanta Improv this weekend. So if you want to see a ghost do stand-up comedy, 
I'm your guy. Uh, you can get tickets at markellislive.com, and you can find me online at 5150 Ellis. Uh, you might be a ghost, because I remember seeing a picture of the interior of Emily Blunt's bedroom, and I thought I saw your face <laughs> in the window. Right, it was, but it was the like... him from outside. I saw a picture of him was like from a hotel with like all these old people, and then his face really small, and I remember zooming in <laughs> on it. was from 1950s. Yeah. I am like, pretty white. And of course... Ashley Mova. Ashley who is not pretty find, white. Who is not pretty white. <laughs> you guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And uh, you can follow me simply on Facebook or on Twitter, just at John Campia. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia for Collider Video, and until next time, bye-bye.